My name's Noah. Hathaway Noah. Gundam Hathaway Movie 1, in short, is a masterpiece. It's a film that radiates confidence and authority in its deliverance from start to finish, packaged together with as much swagger as the titular character's three-piece suit. But the smash hit of the first installment in the trilogy despite having to overcome the adversary of the worldwide coof, the Gundam franchise once again falls back to the Universal Century timeline like it always does. But the fact that a property like Hathaway's Flash, a novel that was considered unadaptable by some, made such a strong impression leaves me hopeful that some other well-deserved works will be adapted. Crossbone Gundam! Hi, I'm Suin. Salutations, fellow Fetties and Zeons. If you're a longtime subscriber of the channel, you will know that I love Gundam and everything about it. Most of the time. It's my favorite media franchise and will most likely continue to follow it well into my middle age, once I realize that accumulating cool-looking plastic is probably not one of the brightest of financial decisions. After my disappointment with Iron-Blooded Orphans, Twilight Axis, and then Narrative, I was ready for the franchise to take a breather, to take a step back into the depths of his vast vault of adapted material, after the string of disappointing releases that Gundam, in my opinion, was running itself into. And then Hathaway's Flash finally arrived after several delays, and it was the closest my emotionless black hole in my chest that you call a heart could come to crying after witnessing the level of attention to detail the staff took in not just the storytelling, but the production value. The depiction of mobile suits attacking on Earth has been done well in both F-91 and War in the Pocket, but what makes Hathaway's Flash stand out is the time of the onslaught. Major events took place during night or in dark areas, giving the pilots an element of surprise to go on the offense. A recurring criticism of the movie was that it was too dark. It made the scenes difficult to follow what was going on, but I think that was an intentional creative decision. The nighttime backdrop of a horde of terrified civilians trying to escape the conflict is what makes the feeling of chaos that much more intense and unfiltered. With only the screams of others of pure survival instincts to guide them, it truly felt messy in the best way possible. When we're in the dark, our other senses are on overdrive to compensate our lack of sight, so we become extremely sensitive to every little change in our surroundings, trying not to let go of your loved one's hands as they struggle to keep up with their running, trying to navigate in a sea of discombobulated voices in a cacophony of screams, trying to avoid a mobile suit's direct line of fire, but you're not sure where their attacks are going to land next and possibly kill you. It hits you that these aren't the cool robots that you see on TV far away from the comforts of your home, but giant killing machines that tower over humans built to wipe out the enemy. Everything is larger than you, so perspectives are warped, and humans accustomed to being on top of the food chain are completely helpless when up against a giant robot. I don't like this. Feels like your weaknesses are out there for everyone to see. The mechs feel weighted due to the effects of gravity on Earth instead of fighting in space. Unlike the agile maneuvering we're accustomed to seeing, the thrusters on the mobile suits feel labored and sluggish as it exerts to continuously push tons of metal off the ground. As a result, the mobile suits move a bit slower, but it feels more natural. With the Kasai and the Penelope being larger, bulkier designs, this is further echoed by the sound effects, where the blast from a beam rifle and the slash of a beam saber has a deeper, richer reverb that carries a sense of scale similar to Gundam Unicorn. If Gundam Unicorn set the bar for animation of the 2010s, then Hathaway's Flash blazed the path forward for the 2020s, and it's a phenomenal way to start the decade. It represents the best of what Gundam is capable of, great storytelling and mecha designs in the backdrop of a tense political drama that is unafraid to showcase some of the unsavory side of human conflict. On top of that, it's completely unapologetic in not even trying to court new fans into the franchise. By forcing the audience to at least know the original 0079 series, Zeta Gundam, and Char's Counterattack, it's already telling you that in order to have a baseline understanding, you need to sink a significant portion of your time before watching these movies, and I personally love that quality. Being upfront early on frees up precious time without having to explain prior events or truncating important info, and without that additional burden, they can focus on the aspects of the story that is integral and not be stretched thin. You immediately know Hathaway is a new type from both the iconic sound effect and him being able to hear Gigi's thoughts before she uttered them out loud. You know what the One Year War and Char's Rebellion is, and why characters are so heavily impacted by those events and continues to influence their decisions and beliefs in Hathaway's Flash. 
those who are unfamiliar with Gundam won't be aware of these tidbits, and in worst cases might consider this a plot hole and not being explained, but not to us. Admittedly, watching this movie and understanding all the references does make me feel like I'm in an exclusive club, and seeing newcomers being completely confused by the story does add to that smug feeling. Hathaway's uncomfortable around oceans? Should I tell you about the view? No, I'm good. Zeta Gundam watchers will know why. Hathaway mysteriously freezes up looking at a hijacker who's about to shoot him? I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem coincidental the guy's wearing a clown mask that resembles Quest's hairstyle. <laughs> but bragging aside, what I'm getting at is, it can be frustrating to watch and for some, the deliverance in the dialogue can be slow and even clumsy for them without casually the characters imply but never explain. I'd rather not make anything worse by putting us in danger, so I'm not talking. While I would argue that opinion is misguided, the fact of the matter is, is that this was made for those who were familiar with the UC timeline. And that's okay. I think as long as the media in question makes it clear who they're catering towards and is transparent in its intentions, it's a valid reason as to why some plot elements can feel glossed over. After all, it's impossible to please everyone, especially in a world that's as dense and long-winded as the Universal Century. Hathaway's Flash, unlike his more popular iterations, is not a large-scale military narrative that culminates in an intergalactic war in its climax. Rather, it's an intimate political drama between rivals that expands upon a character's tumultuous arc, who we've become acquainted with in previous installments. Hathaway serves as an interesting Gundam lead because of several things. One, he is not a brand new character who starts off as a blank slate. He's deeply rooted in the UC timeline with a documented extensive and troubled past. Going back all the way from his childhood in Zeta Gundam to a reckless simping preteen as a supporting character in Shard's counterattack, we have a good idea on who he is as a person and where his ideologies stem from. And now he's been promoted to the status of protagonist in a film trilogy bearing his name, The Ultimate Flex. The trick here is not to build a character from the beginning, but on how to use the pre-existing material to mold said individual into a compelling person that is unique enough to be differentiated from traditional Gundam leads, and Hathaway is the perfect candidate for the role. Which leads to point number two. He's someone who experienced war firsthand both as a civilian and a quote-unquote mobile suit pilot, so he's acutely aware on how devastating it is to lose a loved one on the battlefield, and understands the structure of the political system he's a part of. This means that we're getting a character who's more aware of what's at risk and bases his decisions on experience than letting their youthful naivete guide them before having it shattered before their eyes. And the final reason, number three, are his ties to his family, specifically his father, Bright Noah. Bright was a pivotal character in 0079 and continues to play the role of the mentor and in some cases the surrogate father throughout his appearances. His strong moral compass and no-nonsense approach is his standout quality that also acts as a buffer between the crooked powers from above and the impressionable Gundam leads that inadvertently became his second job as our beloved slapper-in-chief. <coughs> One can only imagine how the back of his hand must feel, with the BS of Hathaway being mafty. As a result, a generational burden has been placed onto the sun under the umbrella of the Federation that distorted Hathaway's reality early on. The ultimate irony is that for a father who has a reputation of setting young pilots straight and being a strong role model for many Gundam leads, the last person you'd expect would go down the wrong path would be his own son. I'm going to change into Mafti Navio Aaron. You made it here, Kasaichi. There's an interesting scene in the manga, Mobile Suit Gundam You See, The Man Who Could Not Ride the Rainbow, that touches upon what happened between Bright and Hathaway in the aftermath of Shar's counterattack that I'll read to you in a translated passage. Bright heard that Hathaway had come onto the ship chasing after Adenauer's daughter, but thought nothing of it. He had been away from his family for too long and had dismissed it as a childish whim. He didn't realize until later that Hathaway was near the same age as Amro, Camille, and Judo once were. Bright turned his back on Hathaway, 
just as he turned his back on Camille and Judo before. It was as if it was karma for his failure to be a father to them. At this point, Bright had completely forgotten about his own son. It wasn't because he was being professional or thinking of the bigger picture, he'd just forgotten. He eventually did recall that Hathaway was on the ship and ordered him to stay on the bridge. But Hathaway disappeared, leaving behind the Haro he had always carried around with him and was only found after the battle in the cockpit of a half-destroyed mobile suit drifting through the void. Hathaway said nothing from then on, and the situation remains the same even now, one month after. Thanks to his crew, this was not left on record. Bright knows he has to speak with Hathaway, but he still can't bring himself to do so. He's incompetent, unable to be a father, even to his own son. Safe to say, I am curious to see how their relationship evolved since those events, when it's no longer between preteen and father, but of two mature adults. If the title of the second movie implies anything, hopefully we see more of this explored as I've heard the original novels didn't delve that much into. Hathaway's views have been strongly influenced by the events of the aforementioned Shars counterattack, and we get to see the duality of his personality come to odds. The hopeful symbol of Mafti Navu Aaron, who intends to uplift the masses and correct the wrongdoings of the Federation, versus those who simply don't have the time to care about the future and are fixated on the struggles of the present. If you gotta work, there's no way you have the luxury to think that far ahead. While the idea of pitting multiple viewpoints against the protagonist's beliefs isn't a novel concept, it's certainly one that Gundam leads are known to confront. The shades of grey that color human thought, and having to choose the path that they feel is best suited for the good of humanity. Hathaway's thoughts are a question wherever he goes, and as a result we see him wavering in his previously ironclad convictions. Despite his intention to assassinate all the Federation officials on the Hounsen, he still saved them from the hijackers even though he could have let them all be murdered. But his pride prevented this because he didn't want Mafti's name being tarnished by a bunch of LARPing terrorists. Hey! We know that he possesses charisma and leadership qualities despite his initial melancholic and standoffish disposition because of several factors. No mentioning of Laplace's box from either side, at least for now the mutual trust and respect he has from his peers, and the split opinion in both the civilian and the military's half-hearted approval concerning Mafti's message, meaning that the Federation has lost much of its support since its inception. Mafti love you, Aaron. Hathaway and his circle have been born into privilege, so they could afford to think beyond tomorrow. He's surrounded by decadence, visualized in his attire, and the company the identity of Hathaway Noah, the son of Bright, surrounds himself with. A card with a bottomless pit of money that also doesn't trace your transactions? Sounds like prime material for some unruly activity. Manhunters and scrupulously checking residence permits of anyone looking remotely suspicious? Perfectly reasonable for them to spray bullets onto a crowded residential area. Make no mistake, Mafti as an organization is a terrorist group. They wreak havoc and destruction, destabilize and create chaos by assassinating government officials, and killed innocent people in the process. But their goals and intentions on paper come across as sympathetic to a growing populace who have been mistreated by the Federation government. Since the Federation forces moved in, things have gotten real bad. Mafti ought to go after them. I wonder why he hasn't yet. However, we also see Hathaway's hesitation to pull the trigger when push comes to shove, and as a result, we see those negatively impacted because of the indecisiveness. Mafti's attempts to exercise caution and minimize civilian damage is taken advantage of when they realize the Federation mobile suits show no qualms with having innocent people caught in the crossfire, as long as they capture the enemy and complete the objective. And the fact that someone like Hathaway, the son of the hero Bright Noah, who is employed by the very mechanism responsible for causing much of the world's blight, is the one leading said organization creates a dilemma in the classic right versus wrong. Do you take the slow route of changing the existing structure from within, or take drastic measures by destroying the decayed foundation and starting anew? One man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. It's going to be a tightrope walk. From here on, it always will be. With two movies still left to be released, there is a general direction that can be determined from the first film, especially if you're familiar with Tomino's body of work during that period. The main point of contention is if the movies will follow the plot of Shars Counterattack or the Beltorchica's children novel, or a little bit of both, as either will affect the direction Hathaway develops as a character. Regardless of where it'll go, I'm giddy with excitement because it checks off everything I love about this beloved franchise. 
Gundam, at least the Universal Century, is not known for its rosy disposition. It's a frank look on the effects of war and the aftershocks that will plague for generations when not corrected with no clear solutions in sight. Hathaway's Flash is a story about someone who, despite his misguided attempts, decides to step up and amend those wrongdoings by voluntarily bloodying his hands. Driven by the guilt and hauntings of his past, Hathaway Noah is a beautifully flawed individual who shoulders the burden of being the successor to both Amuro and Shar's legacy, and watching how he'll quote-unquote execute the wills of these two icons will be interesting. It's about duty, the flawed nature of people and their conflicting interests, and the strength of the human spirit in a deteriorating society. Gunnam Hathaway is proof that everlasting stories have a timeless quality, that no matter how far off in the future the story takes place in, our struggles at its core remains the same. Even though the novels were originally published over 30 years ago, their relevance to today's societal woes have never become more relevant and engaging in an increasingly politically charged and tense environment. You don't have to tell me that! Can never forget! Lefty does things as a friend. Lefty will eventually become a martyr to his cause. But I'll be the person responsible for lopping off his head. Rick, I'm awful. Just awful. All of this. Yeah, it is. Truly awful. <laughs> <laughs>